David Dorsey is a senior associate at Osage University Partners and has been working uh, with DOTM for some time, uh, learning about the kinds of research that's happening here and the kinds of new technologies coming out of labs here at the university. Uh, Osage University uh, Partners is out of Philadelphia and they invest solely in university startup companies. And so I will turn it over to David uh, and let him perhaps sort of chat about a little less than an hour. So sure. it's all yours. Thanks. Thanks a lot, David. Um, yeah, so uh, like Dave said, I'm an investor with uh, OC University Partners. Um, and our model, the way we break it up, is we actually have a team that is devoted exclusively to investing in tech. And, um, and the way we define tech is it's not life science, like not therapeutics. And then we have another team that is investing solely in life science and medical devices and therapeutics. And I'm an investor on the tech side. So um, my own background is, you know, I have a PhD in double E. Um, you know, controls and optimization. Um, I was an engineer at Lockheed Martin for eight years before I started doing this. Um, and I was a you know, PI on um, several DARPA programs. Uh, so that's my background. We are, um, we've been around since 2009, and OCH has just actually closed their third fund. Um, I think we announced it this week internally. And um, so we were targeting a $250 million fund, and we ended up with $270 million. Um, so since 2009, we've done about 97 investments in the university span. And we've done them in hardware, we've done them in software, we've done them in materials. We have two quantum computing companies, we have a metal oxide framework, two cybersecurity companies, like all over the place, right? So we look at lots of stuff that is deeply technical, and we've seen a lot of teams and helped put together a lot of teams for very deep, deeply technical commercial enterprises. And so this talk, uh, today is really to talk a lot about the experiences we've had and the things we look for when we're looking for a team, and specifically a team that is leading up a deeply technical, technical commercial enterprise coming out of the universities. These are not, like, not all <coughs> are the same, and management looks a little bit different depending on the kind of company you are, but there are some things with CEOs and management that I think are almost universal, so we're going to talk about some of that. So. Um, it's a small group, and I don't have a ton of stuff to talk about, so like, feel free at any point to raise your hand. So if you have any questions about something you're specifically working on, um, <coughs> feel free to ask. Uh, so I'm gonna, we're going to actually walk through an exercise where we're trying to hire a CEO for a company that I've recently invested in. So we're going to ask questions about that. Before we get to that, I want to show you a little bit of data uh, that we have uh, gathered about investment. So, um, this is just more background I've ever seen. We actually are one of the top backers of university spinouts in, uh, in North America. Um, and we've done, you know, these are some of our portfolio companies, Kymeta, kind of Menlo Security, uh, Clarify, Kensize. So we've done gene editing, artificial intelligence, new computing architectures. If you're interested, you can look at our website and see our portfolio companies. And you know, a lot of the way, like, the reason why having these you know, 100 portfolio companies like this is useful is that when early stage startups come to us, um, hopefully they're doing something that's sort of related to existing portfolio companies you have, and we can connect them and be helpful. So you see something here that is, um, you know, see a portfolio company that is doing something similar to what we're doing, you know, academically or or, or commercially. Um, you know, feel free to connect with me. Maybe I can put you in touch with them, and we can talk about our uh, strategy. All right, so. I want to talk um, a little bit about some data in our data. So we partner with 100 universities, and we partner with, um, among those uh, 100 universities, the three core university partners of which UIUC is one. And that means I have in my database 6,500 startups, all of which we have had at least one 30-minute conversation to kind of get a sense of like whether or not this is something we'll invest in now, maybe check back in six months, maybe check back in a year, maybe maybe infinity, you know. Um, so, so um, but there's lots and lots of products and we've seen a lot of different things. And so what I did is I went through the data and I had an interesting question of, like, what's the background of the typical CEOs that come out of university startups? Like, how, you know, what was the relationship with the university? Who's the CEO? Who's the chief scientist? And, um, and I came up with these four categories. We'll call them alumni founder, um, CEO professor, professor founder, and an external licensee, okay? 
Um, and so let me define those terms first. So an alumni founder is usually a grad student or postdoc who wants to see this research commercialized. We meet these all the time. They're working on something for their PhD dissertation. They actually want to um, have impact out the world, and so they want to start a company. And so they are the founder of the company, not necessarily the CEO, but they're one of the founders of the company. Then we have um, a CEO professor. Um, and the CEO professor here is where the startup has been founded by the professor, and she also assumes this, the role of CEO at founder. Um, and there's a professor founder, where the professor is an active member of the founding team, like a CTO or a chief scientist or something like that, but not the CEO. And then there's an external licensee. This means that some, um, and you'll see this a lot, OTM is very familiar with this type of serial entrepreneurs who are looking for their next big thing, and so they're looking for intellectual property at universities that can uh, provide a key differentiator for their commercial project to bring together that they're going to take to market. And in this case, the role of the founder, the scientific founder, is passive. It, you know, they, they basically agree to kind of um, allow them to use it, you know, license this technology and take it to market, and they may have a consulting role or a one day a week kind of thing. Right? So here's some, um, some, so what I did was I went into this the database and I pulled 263 of the top startups from our database of, it said at this point it was only 5,000 startups. These are tech startups only, I didn't do my science. There are ones that have already raised venture capital because I needed some data on them. And these are ones that we consider high quality and investable. And in most cases, the ones that were able to raise venture capital tend to be high quality and investable. And so if you look at this here, the x-axis is the total amount that's been raised. It's the sum, not the average. And um, the, the y-axis here is the number of startups that have been created for the four different types that I mentioned. And so what you'll see is that the external licensee, the, the, the sort of serological order license to stuff. Someone, these are usually people who have started businesses before, have started lots of startups to have raised more money. And professor founders, meaning where the professor is deeply involved in the company, but is not the CEO, they tend to raise far more money and start way more startups. Now, every data point on this graph represented is a high quality startup. So you can't dismiss the fact that there are 35 alumni founders, right? Um, and uh, 25 out of this 263 have the professor as CEO. Like it happens. It just happens less often, and they raise conventionally less money. It makes sense. So, just to give you an idea, when venture capitalists look at university spinouts, team really matters. And when someone has business experience, right? Meaning not like a business education degree, meaning that they've done a startup before, it's much easier to raise money. And there are more startups at the start of this. So it shouldn't be too surprising, but if it is, feel free to ask questions. Um, but the, at the role of the active founder professor, I want to say, is actually very um, key here. Right? And if you look, the, the, the largest number of startups here is where the professor is really active. So they actually do play a very fundamental role um, uh, in the startups themselves. Another thing at, um, is looking at their tech background. So, um, you know, what this is saying is the highest degree that was earned by the CEO. And I would say, I talk to most VCs and I ask them, how many uh, CEOs in tech, not in life science, because life science, they almost, you know, lots of PhDs and MDs, but in tech, how many of them have PhDs? Out of this data set of 263, 40% of them have PhDs, which I thought was very high for CEOs. Like, compare this to overall internet startups where there's like more college dropouts than there are PhDs and they were running the companies. Like, this tells you that university spouts are different. And, and, and it stands a reason. The reason why is because the CEO is the sole narrator of the story. They have to tell this compelling story. And if they can't grasp the underlying fundamentals of the science, too, then they're going to tell a story that's weak. Like, they're not going to be able to tell a compelling story. So anyway, I thought that was a very interesting uh, data point. And also here, um, is that MBAs made up uh, less than 20% of the CEOs of the total data set. And they make up far less than what we've invested in. And they raise proportionate amounts of capital, which I find interesting too. Like, you would think that, like, if an MBA was going to be really good at something, it would be like they could raise more money than an academic founder. And actually, they raise about, on average, the same amount as an academic founder. So, um, it doesn't seem to give much of an advantage there. Um, so, anyway, successful CEOs of deep science are usually technically strong. I, that, that's I, a, a statement I feel like I can make. 
So here's the, this is the, the, the companies that, that OUP is invested in and their background. So red, when it says past success, that means they had a startup before, they sold it, they made some money. We are confident that, that, they're, that they're gonna do well again. Um, startup in blue, the 23%, the that means that they have startup experience. Unclear whether or not it's success, but it's startup experience. Um, academic is 21%, meaning that their background was almost entirely academic. Right? We've, we've invested in a number of academic companies. Um, some of them came from big companies, but less, like only, only invested in two of those. I'll get into why that ends up being the case, and six of them came from industry. Um, and I, 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 I feel like we put it here just because we want to enforce the fact that the VC is making worse CEOs. Right? So we've invested in zero VCs, and we'll probably never invest in VCs. Venture capitalists, uh, like myself, I don't know why it is. I, I wish I understood it, but venture capitalists don't make very great CEOs. Uh, and they often have a, a, um, uh, a hard time doing what it is they're really good at assessing others. They don't really do. Um, and so, um, most important factors that contributed, every time we make an investment, we always write down what the key reason why we invested in this or why they were successful. And in this case, like we went back and looked at it, like what really drove the success. And you know, um, sometimes it's luck, six percent of the time. Uh, Twelve percent of the time, it's just timing, like they just came out at the right time with the right product. Um, Fifty percent of the time, though, it's the team. It's the team that drives. It really, like, and almost, I think most DC will tell you this, that they're team first investors. And it's not a controversial. Um, and the reason why we don't invest in companies, and the reason why they most often fail is also the team. It's, it's also the biggest contributing factor. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to walk through um, a kind of a CEO search for a, um, a sort of fictitious company. And, uh, and we're going to just talk about like how we think about interviewing candidates. And um, this hopefully will give you some idea of how VCs think about this. So, so going back to the previous slide, how do you measure team as um, as, a, as a most important factor? Uh, for failed, yeah. failed investing? So you have a CEO, for example, that over promises and never meets numbers. Um, like you can meet, like that's a, that's a team problem, it's a management and governance issue. They couldn't have brought higher talent or people were quitting and had a lot of churn in their, in their uh, employee base. That's a governance and management problem, that's team. It's a team problem. So, um, like, if you can, if you can show, like, with confidence, that's the primary reason, um, then then we put it on the team. And of course, it's never just one thing. Right? But if you're going to pick one thing that's going to have the most influence <coughs> over all the other things, it's team. Right? So, uh, what do you think are the primary uh, responsibilities for great CEO? Responsibilities? Yeah. You know, honestly, like I'll tell you, I, I, one of the companies we invested in recently, I went to go see him, uh, to see how he's doing. I went to go visit, and he was um, he was fixing the electrical outlets on the walls because they weren't working properly, and nobody could plug in their laptops in this one conference room. Like, great CEOs do everything at this stage, right? Um, but the main thing they have to do, like the, like the two things that are really important, is they have to be great at recruiting, which means they have to be great at telling a story, right? So when you're recruiting people for a startup, you're essentially telling people to take a job that in a company that might not exist soon, right? Um, and you're also giving them as compensation kind of equity in the company that may not exist soon. They have to believe that this is a real thing. So you have to get a compelling storytelling. The other thing you have to be really good at is raising money, which also means you have to be a very good storyteller. Right? So the two things you always have to be doing as a CEO is you have to be great at recruiting. These people that we meet that are great CEOs usually have kind of an infectious personality. People like being around them. They want to follow them around. When we do diligence, sometimes we'll ask um, to speak to people who used to work for them and find out if they followed them to, to their various jobs. And often you'll find that they sort of take it over to the work. I really like the data-driven um, presentation here. So, I'm wondering what the definition of the startup, which phase of the startup you'll be focusing on? Is it like bootstrap or starting or product market feed or growth? Which stage? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. We're going to um, we'll get into that a little bit more later. But when we're talking about team, um, uh, we're talking about every stage. Okay, um, so 
the, the two things, when we talk about it, um, good at raising money and good at recruiting, you have to do that at the bootstrap phase. You have to do that when you raise your first funding. You have to do that again when you're doing product market fit. And you got to do it again when you scale. And a lot of really successful companies have the same CEO from the day one. From day one. Because every time there's a management change, it's a risk. Like you're always introducing risk. So when we want to invest in a company, we, we recognize that very often there's turnover and we're going to replace the CEO. But we would like to know that the person who's starting the company at the bootstrap level is actually the person that's going to drive this to scale. But when I'm talking about companies specifically, most of the time I think when I'm evaluating them for an investment, it's a series A. So they've been running for a little bit, they've got some traction, it might not be revenue, it could be that like it's an open source project and they have you know, 300 GitHub stars or something like that. They have some evidence that someone cares about the project already, and now what they want to do is raise an equity finance. And that's usually the point that we're doing this evaluation. Now, the trick is though, is very often we find before that time comes, you have to hire a CEO for the company. Um, because again, other companies that are not university based, what ends up happening is the CEO is the founder and starts the company. But very often here, we're graduate students or we're professors or we're researchers and we've got a really good idea and we need to bring in a CEO who has experience. So how do you do that? How do you hire them? What do you look for? That's what these kinds of questions are asking. So this company, this fictitious company, the Quantum Cubic uh, company, and this is a little far fetched in the timeline we're talking about here, but it's a it's a photonic quantum computing company. Um, you know, so it's not using superconducting, like it's you know it's sort of an optical approach. Um, and it's a uh, um, the idea is that it's a quantum machine with compute power that's orders of magnitude existing. You know, that's what all of there's a we have two quantum computing companies that don't the idea is that it can solve valuable problems like it, it, it eventually 15 years from now. Who knows? Right? Um, so the key facts here is that they expect to have some commercial product available in two years, and that's the part that's going to this slide. Um, and they're going to develop both hardware and application software. So there's a Hardware component. It's not like they're just making like op amps or you know, amp, you know amplifiers. They're making there's a stack. There's a tech stack here. So um, it's a little more complicated than that than just components. Um, during the next two years, they're going to establish close relations with corporate partners like Microsoft, like IBM, like Google um, as channel partners, um, and they're going to need to raise three million dollars in seed money now. And then in two years, they're going to need to raise twenty million dollars in a Series A plan. And they have a three-person engineering team in place today. One of them is, you know, a postdoc. Two of them are like friends. That's the team. That's who we met, right? And this is um, actually, let's make one of them a professor. Okay, so one of them is a professor. All right. So we got really lucky, and they gave us four candidates to choose from uh, to interview for this position. And the first one has 10 years of experience and was an engineer at Broadcom and left to become a VP of product development at a networking startup that Cisco acquired for $200 million. So it's a person who has hardware experience, understands what it takes to take hardware to market, you know, understands things like tape outs and you know how expensive they can be to get, you know, um, uh, um, air, like what, what happens when you have errors in your final reference design. Like understands like all the complicated stuff to take hardware to market. And also um, has done some product work, like understands what it takes to build a product, to market that product, to package something that customers want to buy, and <coughs> sold it to a to a large uh, customer, Cisco, for 200 million. <coughs> Sounds good. Like, that's a really good candidate, and it's um, a candidate that like you'd be lucky. At. So another one, candidate B, is a three times successful entrepreneur in software, hardware, and another one in medical devices. One company went public. One of them was acquired by Medtronic. And one of them is still private. We don't know what's going on with that. And then candidate C is a former general manager at IBM's quantum computing group. And prior to that, uh, he was the CTO of a server business unit at IBM. So it's like definitely like the, this is the only person in this list so far, um, with the exception of the next one, that has some like quantum experience. And then the last one, candidate D, is a founding <coughs> guy of a company. Um, and served as a CTO of a previous university, spit out for two years in resistive brand memory space. So it's like sort of a, you know, another hardware space. It's a professor um, that has founded another company um, uh, and served as a CTO, now as a CEO. So like, just, just knowing this, does everybody understand the, the layout? 
I'm going to ask you to raise your hands for each one of these candidates. Tell me, just knowing what we know now, like what do you think is the best candidate? Uh, and I don't know what the right answer is, right? I, I have a, like what I think is the right answer. So how many of you would say candidate A is the best candidate? Okay? Six people, all right? How about candidate B? It's a, it's a pretty large group. How about candidate C? Another minority opinion. And how about the founding PI? All right. I agree with the consensus here. So I actually think candidate B is the best one. The reason why um, is that a lot of great CEOs um, typically have the ability, like we have found, they have the ability, first of all, they know how to take stuff to market and sell it, independent of um, the particular domain, they tend to be deeply technical and understand, they can understand technical material, but they don't have to be deeply, deeply in domain expertise uh, in that particular product. And actually, someone who's been able to have success in software and hardware and medical devices is one of these kind of product market fit junkies. Like they just know how to take stuff to market. They know how to product fit. And it doesn't, ma no ma it doesn't matter what it is. So if they're interested in taking on a project like this, like that's someone that I'd like to see be CEO. Um, and there's lots of questions you need to ask. I'll then also talk about some of the ones, um, we'll get into this, because we're going to dig a little deeper with more questions. So, um, so, you know, the kinds of questions you want to ask for candidate A, this is the person from Broadcom, is whether or not they had a track record of success. And one of the problems with Broadcom and also at IBM, is when people say they have like a title like VP of product at IBM or at, at Broadcom, that title can mean something very different from one place to the next. Like, you know, I worked at Lockheed Martin, and I would you know, meet people who were called you know, tech VP of enterprise, and they would have like no technical background, like none. And so it, like, it's just a title. It doesn't mean anything. You can't really figure out what it means. You don't know, like, were they, were they, were they like, did they have five people working under them? Did they have 50? Is that even a good measure? Does it even matter? Did they have impact in the bottom line of the company? Like, did they create a new product or were they taking some legacy product from, you know, 10 years ago and, and, and continue to find new customers for it? It's very difficult to assess someone who comes from a big company like this. And so, you have to ask about interim promotions. Uh, you have to ask about whether or not the startup that he was involved with really success. In other words, how much capital did it raise? So, like, if it sold for $200 million, but it raised $190 million, that's not great. You know? um, so transitions. Anytime there's a transition, like we have to find out why that happened. Why did they leave Broadcom? Why did you do this? Um, and so these interviews take a long time because we really get into their, their personal business. Uh, domain expertise, like um, how do we get comfortable that this person understands or can understand quantum computing? Um, how curious are they? Uh, and the last thing here is, is leadership. Like, given that it's a first-time CEO, can they be a leader? Like, did they manage a team in the startup? Did they have quality people that they've recruited in the past? Like, and like I was saying before, like, do their colleagues follow them from one job to the next? These are the kinds of things you're looking for. It's a little obscure when you're dealing with somebody who's coming from a big corporation. Also, wall talent. This is like sort of an intangible way that you meet with them and you just get a sense that they're deep listeners. Like, they really hear everything you say. They see it, say it back to you clearly, they're articulate, and they understand. Like they have a deep understanding of what people are expecting from them. They have this kind of um, emotional sensitivity, right? All right. So the candidate B, the one that we like, uh, or the one that I like, um, the kinds of things that we ask here is we really want to understand the time when we're rolling each one of these companies. Well, a lot of times, what you'll find out is people are like, I've had six successful exits. Well, like, that's a really grand statement to make, but when did you leave? Did it exit after you left? Did it exit before you left? Like, when did they raise money? What role did you have in the transition? What role did you have in selling the company? What role did you have in founding the company? So if you're only there for a year and you didn't help found it, you didn't help sell it, like, what was your role in that company? So um, uh, you really have to get into each and every one of these and find out, like, when did you start? Can we talk to people who work there? And you get into all these things about, um, uh, uh, you know, how other people who work there view them. Um, so, you know, some of these are, like the medical device uh, uh, was acquired by Medtronic for 80 million, but raised 50 million, okay? 
kind of raises the issue more. That's not always a bad thing. Like sometimes, like medical devices is a tough industry. Maybe the markets changed like while this was happening. It used to be that devices were really hot and it was easy to raise lots of money, and then they weren't anymore. It was hard to sell those companies. So like raising 50 and only selling it for 80 doesn't mean it's a bad manager. So it's also hard to assess like what it means about candidate fee. Um, the private company that's still private was funded by very good. Uh, um, firms, Sequoia and Excel. Um, the CEO is recruited um, uh, replacement after raising the venture round, though, because B thought the company needed domain expertise. So um, this is saying that this person is aware of his own limitations, and um, he or she has decided that at some point in a successful company, she's not really the best leader for the company anymore because they've gotten to the point now where they need domain expertise. Right? And that says a ton about these kinds of people. Like, what you want is someone who's always thinking about the company first. And so we'll always ask you questions like hypothetically like, okay, so let's say after we raise this next round, um, we decide that you know we're going to be going this other channel to market. We're going to be doing lots of corporate <coughs> partnerships. We don't have any experience with that. Like, what are your thoughts of maybe in the future potentially stepping aside for someone who has that expertise? You want to hear unequivocal, sure, I'll do what's best for the company. That's what you want to hear. You don't always hear that. Sometimes you get somebody who says, well, I don't know why I wouldn't be able to you know, make partnerships with Microsoft. And it's like, well, because you've never done it. I know, but you know, there's first time for everything. I know, but if we're just asking if we found somebody who's better at it, we just step aside. And if they hesitate, it's a, it's a red flag. These things get really emotional. They really do. Um, so this one here, the the, um, the IBM guy, you see this a lot actually, for someone who's been at a company for say 30 years. Um, the reason why they're not a good CEO has to do with the fact that they're not willing to change electric sockets. They're not willing to order new tiles from the bathroom because they broke. They're not willing to renegotiate the rent with the landlord. They, they're used to having two administrators who do their scheduling for them and 50 people who send up reports that they read and then you like sit back in the chair and they come back and say, here's what we're going to do next. And they strategize. Like, you can't have someone like that at a startup. Like, startups like, have to figure out like, how we can save money on lunch and stuff. Like, I mean, you know, that's, that's, it's a very different ordeal. And like, we have, usually when we encounter people like this, what they're saying is, like, oh, how much do you think you should get paid for this? And they're saying $300,000 salary. I mean, you're taking runway away from the company. You're going to raise a $3 million seat, which is what we just said. Well, $300,000 a year is going to the CEO. It's not like it's a ton of money out of the three million, but it just shows that like his incentives aren't aligned with ours. Our incentives are that we want everybody to make a ton of money off of this, off equity, right? And so in some cases, I've had situations where like, I've been approached to work at a startup, and I've had people say, I'll pay your current salary, now how much do you want to give me back to buy equity? Because they want to find out like how much equity is important. And so what, you want, what they want to hear you say is, I'll work for free. Give me as much equity as this cash will buy. That's what they want to hear. And because you want someone who's interested or aligned with you, if they're making three hundred thousand dollars a year, they're not incentivized in the same way as you are to exit for a billion dollars, right? So this is one of the problems when you take to someone who has like lots and lots of industry experience with a high-paying job is that they're not a good fit culturally for the startup, and they also have expectations that are different about, about the, the way they spend, and they also spend money. Typically, they're they have higher burn rates. They're used to big budgets. Um, the last one here is the is the PI. Lots of industry connections. Several members of this person's lab went to follow him into his last company, so actually it was um, uh, pretty good. Um, and you know, in this story, what we find is that like he feels disgruntled after being forced out of the previous company, and he's um, determined for his CEO skills. And I think you know, the reason why this is in this slide is it actually is a, a characteristic that we do encounter quite frequently, where academic founders see entrepreneurialism as another domain uh, that they will master and dominate. And um, it's, it's more than just a domain expertise. It's more than just like a bunch of books. It's actually, it's a culture. It's a way of, it's a, it's a way of thinking. Like, I, um, being an entrepreneur is very difficult. Choosing to be an entrepreneur is to choose like a pretty painful path to success. Like it's not easy to do, not, it's not cut out for everyone, and it's not something I think that people learn like they learn advanced calculus. Like it's not like that. 
And so um, I think very often people who are very, very smart think that it's another domain area of, 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 of that they can dominate. It's just not the case. And so that's why we added this in. But to give you like a little bit of background, this is partly based on a real story. We invested in a company out of Yale called Quantum Circuits. Um, and uh, Rob Schulkoff, the founder, is not disgruntled, actually. He's a very thoughtful uh, person. And when we met with him, they were selling like, parametric amplifiers, and then eventually they said they wanted to make a quantum computing company. So when we invested in them, they were looking for a CEO. We were trying to hire them. We were getting candidates like the ones that we just talked about here. But we actually ended up just going with Rob. And the reason why is because Rob said, when we asked him, look, if we find the right person later on down the road after we raise, would you step aside? And he said, absolutely. Like, you know, I'm a tenured professor at Yale. I have no interest in running this company. But I do think I'm the right person because right now, this is a still a scientific project, and I know how to run this project. And so like, I'll get all the help I need. I don't know how to build product. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do corporate partnerships. But like, when we raise our next round, I hope we can hire good people to help me do that. He said all the right things. And so we invested in the Series A. So Kuya came in and led the round, too. Um, um, so in, in what we ended up doing was actually backing the professor. So I think you know, this is a fictitious story, but some of it's you know, relevant. Sometimes that's the, um, that's the best thing to do. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Sometimes you can't hire a great CEO. So what do you do in the meantime? So anyway, there's, there's lots of molds of successful entrepreneurs. It's not just one. They, they look different. They, really have to scratch the surface. The problem is that they all look really strong at first. Not all. Many of the top ones, though, like when you first meet them, you think, oh, this, this person really like, wants to do this. They're totally driven. They're really ambitious. But then you start scratching the surface, you find out that maybe they're not aware of their own weaknesses. Like, everybody has weaknesses. It's really important to ask them, like, what, what do you, I know like, when we go to interviews and somebody says, tell me about the things that you think you're not good at. And we don't know how to answer that question because it seems silly. The answer is important. Like the answer is important when you're backing a CEO because you can fix it. Because I, I'll say, like if that's something you're not good at, let's hire somebody who does just that, right? Like that's something we can fix. But if you don't tell me what you're not good at, we can't help it. And so you don't want someone who's not going to tell you what they're afraid of, what their challenges are. You want someone who's really forthcoming. This was something I actually had a hard time with when I started investing because as an engineer, lucky you don't go walking around telling everybody what you're not good at. Right? Um, but entrepreneurs that are really good ones, like actually are really upfront, and they come in and say things like, yeah, we're totally not going to make our numbers, I completely messed up, and they'll say like exactly what they messed up on, and they'll say what their lessons learned, and here's what I'm going to do next time, here's the safeguards we're going to put in place to make sure this never happens. And no one punishes them for it, because that's what you want. Like, you want to foster that kind of... Um, curiosity and learning from their, 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 from their mistakes. And that's a very different culture. It's a very different cultural uh, posture than like, what I was experiencing with engineering, which is like, I better fix this before somebody finds out something. <laughs> it's not, it's not even to talk about it, you know? Um, so anyway, if they, if they have experience, you can, they have some track record, you can go back and look at it. But if they don't have experience, um, you want to ensure they recognize it and surround themselves with people that they do. That's a really important point. Um, and you also have to be able to spot if a candidate is just too corporate for a start. I mean, they just, it's hard to unlearn like, the doctrination you get working for a long period of time in a giant, like, you know, 20 billion dollar revenue company. Um, and, you know, how do you evaluate their domain expertise? Like, ideally, the candidate knows the domain from a direct experience, but not always. And um, if the candidate doesn't have the direct experience, um, you just want to make sure that they can recruit people who have it, right? So again, this kind of personality uh, that you're looking for, this kind of personal charisma. You know, this is um, stuff that we're always looking for: tracker, success, thoughtful. The, the ones I want to there's there's some ones at the bottom I want to highlight here. Um, we are very sets up about being a great leader, the ability to attract and retain talent. They're intensely entrepreneurial, like they're sales driven. They're always thinking about selling something, story, selling the job title, selling the startup to their friends. They sell it to everybody. Like some of these guys, they'll come and you'll meet them and you'll say, like, so how did you raise your first fifty eight thousand dollars? And like friends and family. Like, <laughs> you know, when people bootstrap and they say they raise their money for their friends and family, that means you're a good storyteller. Like, because you've got nothing. Like you're going to people that you're related to and you're 
tell them why they should give you money. And they're not, you know, no one's going to get rich off of this, right? So, like, it, it, bootstrapping also tells how, how um, what we, the word we use is scrappy. Like, you don't have a lot to work with, but you can make, you can get 10x multiplier out of a little bit that you can uh, work with. So, what we um, very often see is that they're just good salespeople. Um, when we say scrappy, they can accomplish a lot with a little bit of capital. Uh, very often we encounter entrepreneurs where they come to us and we ask them how much they want to raise, and they say 20 million is their first round raising, and um, we ask them why. It's because they want to hire 40 people, and they want to get like this big office space, and it doesn't make any sense. Like you don't even know if it's going to work out yet. Let's raise three million at a you know reasonable valuation, so you don't give away all this company and equity. They just, the way they think about the way they think about capital, like you want them to be conservative. And the reason why is because whatever your business plan is, so you have a plan, you raise $3 million, the plan is that this $3 million lasts you for 12 months. The problem is six <coughs> months into the business, you realize that this business is never going to work, and you need to do a massive pivot. And now that 12 months of capital needs to last you 18 months. right? Um, you've got to be uh, like able to tighten your belts and, and to, to decrease your burn. Because the other alternative is going to investors and asking for more money, and they're not punishing for the valuation because you're not doing, it's not going well, like admittedly, right? So spending, um, uh, um, like being very cash conservative, is one of the, the, the things we would like to see in, in first time entrepreneurs. Transparency and ethics. There's been a couple of. Um, there have been a couple of companies I think we probably could have made a lot of money on, but we just wouldn't invest in them just because we sensed that there was something out of the going on. There's been a few times where some lawsuits were in the background. And, you know, people get sued, and it doesn't mean they did anything wrong. But when we go and scratch surface and kind of ask people like, what they were really being sued for, it's usually um, it's usually stuff that, like, it's plausible that they're innocent, but probably not. And so we just don't take that risk. And a lot of other VCs don't either. All right, so what do you do when you don't have a CEO? So let me put it to you guys. So go back to the quantum computing company. There's no CEO. So you know, you have three engineers. You've got a code base. You've got a, you know, scientific discovery. You've got something that you want to sell. And you really could use a CEO. You know you need a CEO. There's no question. And you'd be able to raise money with a really good CEO at a better valuation. So like, what do you do, though, if you can't find a good one? This happens all the time. So do you hire a less than perfect one? Do you hire an interim outside CEO, so you have a temporary CEO? Do you have the academic founder serve as the interim CEO, or do you have just no CEO? Who thinks that you do no CEO? How about academic founder? All right. How about uh, interim outside CEO? All right. And how about less than perfect CEO? All right. So there's problems with all of these, right? They're none of them are perfect. And the problem with the hiring of less than perfect CEO is removing a less than perfect CEO is very difficult to do. So removing a CEO is hard. It's really hard to do. And it usually has to happen on the on when you bring on another investment. So um, it creates a lot of animosity. Sometimes people form factions. You just you have to stick with them forever. And given that, like I said, those investments fail because of team, like this is problematic from the beginning. Because they haven't said that they're ever going to step aside, which means you're going to force them out of the way. You assume you have to force them out. An interim outside CEO sounds nice, except um, I don't know of any CEOs who take interim CEO positions. They say they're taking an interim CEO position. What they secretly believe is that they're going to show you that they're the best CEO you've ever hired. And they're going to stay on for the long term. So interim is a fake title. Like, that's just my experience. And that's um, something that, that makes us concerned. Like, what's their, you know, what are their motives for doing it? Now, an interim CEO that is the academic founder, I understand their incentives. They want to have impact. So, like, interim makes sense to me when it's the founder. When Rob said he's going to be the interim <coughs> CEO for quantum circuits, I believe him because he really wants quantum circuits to be successful. We couldn't hire a CEO. He helped us try to find a CEO. So that interim title is legal. And in here, like this is probably the least of all the bad ones. But not every CEO, like not every professor founder is like Rob. Like Rob's a good listener, Rob is articulate, Rob is like really good at hiring. Come on. Like some of them are not. And so um, that might not be a good interim CEO either. And then the last one, having no CEO, is a, is a non-starter. Because you've got to raise money, 
can the investors only want to talk to the CEO? So if you call yourself like president or CSO, like it doesn't work. Somebody has to be the CEO, and if there isn't somebody with that title, that means that we suspect that somebody is operating as CEO, even without, because like, there has to be one. There is no such thing as a company without a CEO, right? So um, that's a non-starter for investors too. We alluded to this before, you also mentioned something about this about time. Uh, the program is changing over time. The initial spin out, it's a project, you know, that you try to fill. So the ability to collaborate with your inventors, they're going to be technically strong, hands on. Like the, the, the original CEO has to be kind of hands on, but they also have to be a strong recruiter because they have to hire and they have to be a strong fundraiser because they need to raise more capital. Um, the next stage is product development, and they have to be good at finding product market fit. They have to be, have, um, a strong sales talent and able to make partnerships. So they have to be a, 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 a strong recruiter and a strong fundraiser again. And then at this commercial scale, they have to be great sales and marketing, building a sales engine, hiring salespeople, managing that sales engine, a strong manager, because now they have a lot of people to manage. And then they also still have to be a strong recruiter and a strong fundraiser. And we, like often what you find is the same person is evolving through these roles from initial spin out to commercialization. That's an extraordinary person. Like, I could not do this. Like the same person who's hands on building stuff at the initial spin out is also like great at managing and is also great at selling and great at finding product market fit. This is a this is a Herculean task. So like I don't want anybody to like I, if, if I haven't said it, you know, made it clear, like, I think I should put like great entrepreneurs right? right? Okay? Because they are. And I think that it's something that people can grow into, um, and it takes experience, it takes just trying it out, stuff like that. But what you'll find, though, is that what they all have in common is that they're strong recruiters and they're strong fundraisers. They can tell a good story. And because you guys are selling technical products, it helps that you have a technical background. So um, that's our experience. You know, what we do, this is like sort of inside baseball, but we call previous investors, we looked on LinkedIn, we do Google searches. We, we, we do like more background checks than the FBI like, if you were doing top secret clearance. Like, we call everybody. We call everybody. We've had some CEOs come to us and say, like, you know, I feel a little uncomfortable with the fact that like we're calling with everybody I know. And we say, you know, this is the way I mean, it's the way it is. So we call everybody. And um, and we try to very, very hard to avoid confirmation bias. And all kinds of biases. The problem with VCs is that we like people who are like us, right? And so that's not, I already said VCs don't make good CEOs. So that's not a good investment strategy. Right? You can't, I can't hire people that are like me. Because by definition, they'll be failures. I need to hire people who are demonstratively, by some data, by some measure, good at recruiting and selling the story and raising money. Right? Like I, those are the people that we want to back. And so I don't want someone who's like, great to have a beer with necessarily. I want somebody to demonstrate that like they're 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 infectious. That people want to be around, them. people want to join their team, they get excited. When I think about like what drives me to invest in a company or not invest in a company, when I get a little bit of jealous, like when I feel jealous like I want to join their team because they look like they have a lot of fun and I know they're gonna be successful and I'm gonna quit my job, <coughs> and that, that makes me want to like fun the company. Like, I get like that's what I think. And it's usually because the CEO She's like telling such an amazing story, you just want to jump in. You want to quit your job, take a paid time to go join this team. Like if you meet someone like that, that's a great scene. So I hope, I hope this is helpful. And I, I'm leaving a little bit of time here for any additional questions. But I just want to say like, this is true across the board for VCs, but especially true for university spinouts, just because they usually have the sort of unique uh, characteristic where they founded the company without a CEO, right? And the question is, what do you do in the meantime? And I'm saying, if you guys are thinking about starting a commercial effort, look around yourselves and ask yourself if you have these qualities. And if you don't, find someone who does to help you lead this. Because it really makes a big difference whether you're funded, whether the company is successful or not. And you know, um, people like me, like you know, VCs have a large network of potential CEOs, uh, potential people. You know, people who started multiple startups. I have you know, 97 portfolio companies, many of whom are going to be selling, and which means the CEOs will be free to do something new. Like We have resources. We can connect you with people that you might want to meet and tell them your story. And maybe you can convince them to you know, take on your project. So, over up to questions. 
it's not necessarily related to the topic, but um, how did you transition from engineer eight years to this? Yes, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I was offered a job at DARPA as a project manager. So I got to the point at Lockheed where principal engineer is kind of like the top engineer. You can either become a manager or you can, uh, your rates are too high for you to do anything interesting. Yeah. So, so you kind of have to move on and do something else. So I was going to go to DARPA and become a project manager. And the reason why was because I wanted to be able to see lots of cool technology on me. That's what you do. Um, but my wife, who was a patent examiner, wanted to move back to DC. And so she told me to please look around and see the lots of things. And I had someone who was at Mach, he was also a VC and recruited me for this position. And when he sat me down and asked me, like, do you want to join a venture capital firm? I said no. And then the second time he asked me, I said no. So because finance didn't sound like something I wanted to do. But when I started interviewing and seeing like what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, like I fly around and I meet with professors at university campuses, I read papers, I go to academic conferences, like half of my time is spent doing seeing more stuff than I would have seen at Darwin, right? And I'm learning a lot about the private sector. So it was a, uh, um, it was not planned. Like I didn't know, I didn't know anything about what it meant to be in terms of the job. And after I did my initial interview, um, uh, they had sort of a company pitch to me. They asked me like, what I thought. And I had lots to say about the technology, and, and they asked me like, what do you think of the team? And I was like, it's cool. And, um, <laughs> and they were like, you're, you're got to learn how to assess people. That tech is the least important thing in this center. So there's a big work. Oh, uh, so to agree with myself, uh, I'm a grad student here at Yale Law Engineer like yourself. Um, my professor, I think my story is very relatable to your professor. You know, the story that you talked about, academic advisors. Yeah. Um, my professor and their collaborators want to start a company with the research we did, uh, and but there's no CEO. Like mm -hmm. that's a you know, it's a common problem. It's a common problem, and they asked me to do it, but I'm, you know, <laughs> I know I'm working for a star right now. I know how much work it takes, yeah. and I don't really want to, you know, pursue it as a CEO. Right. Um, how, as not from a venture capitalist point of view, but maybe like as an engineer point of view, uh, how would you find that CEO who wants to take, you know, that level of passion and you know, innovation like to the project that they haven't really worked on, or because, quite frankly, I don't want to give my research to someone who's just going to, you know, trash it and just, you know, make it worse or have, no, you know, yeah. I want it to make it grow into something impactful and, you know, helpful. Um, and I'm not really sure where to start to look for So I've taken those. all these kinds of projects where I try to help people find CEO. And so what I usually do is, like, I usually, I usually have to set up, like, 10 meetings with them and people who have had some experience in the market they want to get into or there's some chemistry. Like where they really like, like they trust, like you'll, you'll meet somebody that I'll introduce you to who has had a successful start in the past, and you'll trust her. Like you'll, you'll say, like, she, she's not, she's not, like she really wants the same thing I do. We're aligned here, and we want to have an impact. This isn't someone who's like, wants to take over and thinks she knows everything. Like she, she wants to learn, she has lots of questions. Like you'll meet someone like that, and it, it'll impress you. Um, and it's the kind of, like, that's the signal that you get um, for a great CEO. So I have told. Uh, people do this before, and like, but if I, if you didn't know, like, if you, if you didn't reach out to me, I would go on LinkedIn, and I would look for companies that are doing something that you aspire to do, or like, get to the point where you aspire to. Find someone like sort of high up in the startup that's not the CEO, or maybe someone who recently left. Like on LinkedIn, you can, or at least I can, because I don't work uh, on my account. You can search for the last place they worked. So you like somebody who previously, like, if you were doing something in networking, like previously product person at Akamai might be a good candidate for CEO. So, like, we, you know, we've worked together to kind of talk about, like, what's the profile of the person? And then go sort of find them and just cold email and say, like, hey, I got a startup idea. Can you give me 30 minutes of your time? And see what you think. Like, that's really what it takes. You'll probably have 50 conversations, which you might want to It's not easy. You know, it's, not, it's not easy. But it's a very important thing. And something you should be spending tons of time on. Is there uh, some kind of a conflict between VCs and the founders as uh, when the CEO choice is involved? And I, here is what I have in mind. Uh, there may be two candidates. One is very highly qualified, and, um, <clears throat> and, and from the overall team point of view, they will be very good. Uh -huh. But they are looking for a much larger share of the pie. Yep. And I understand the argument, the pie needs to grow bigger. That's the biggest argument. Mm -hmm. But, but there is a tension here between the VC interest and the founder interest. 
Uh, is, 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 is that reality? Does it happen? It is reality. So that definitely happens. And so um, let me just throw out some numbers. Like, on, like uh, the, the, the amount of equity a founding CEO, like the one who's really going to drive this thing to exit, um, is usually asking for somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of the companies sometimes, right? Like they're asking for a ton of it, and it, like because they have signed on that they are going to be the ones who drive, make the like you say, the pie bigger. I got to believe that as a VC, right? Because we're going to put in 10 million dollars to own 20 percent, right? And so, like you, when I say like we're going to we're going to call everybody you know, I mean we're going to call everybody you know. And the reason why is because you're going to probably like at first at least this is the person who's going to own more than everybody else. Right? So it depends on like, are they really that good? Are they really that good that they deserve 30%? So there shouldn't be a conflict. If there is a conflict, we're not gonna invest in the company, right? Um, but if it's agreement, if, it's, if there's an agreement that this person is good, so good that they should have that much equity, then our interests are perfectly aligned. We want the pie to be bigger, they want the pie to be bigger, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, so you'd be surprised like how much, like we don't, like, we don't have a problem with people owning more than us. We just wanted to know, to us, equity is like a resource, finite resource, and we want to use it, we want to optimize its usage. So if the best way to spend 40% of my equity is to get the best CEO who's proven that she can drive to a, to a big exit, that's fine. No confidence. Yeah. So, I mean, it's always a little more complicated than that, but in general, yeah.